This is the newsroom for today, Wednesday, February 24, 2021. We're broadcasting to you on E1, SCAR TV, NTN and Tarzi TV in Bartica. In the headlines, two fires in 24 hours in the West Bank of Demerara have ravaged several houses, left several homeless and millions of dollars in damages. Everything, nothing get for safe. A wanted bulletin is issued for the main suspect in the murder of a Tiger Bay man, which took place at a party on Republic Day with 500 people. <laughs> Guyana has approved Russia's Sputnik and China's Sinopharm COVID vaccines for emergency use. Minister of Tourism, Industry and Commerce Onesh Waldron upbraids the coalition opposition for radicalizing and racializing the debate on the 2021 national budget. And in sport, find out about the improvements to the drag race strip at South Dakota and T. Mohammed's promises record-breaking times this weekend. With the news, I'm Avanar Shamzan. Thanks for joining us. We started by telling you that the body of 54-year-old Sandra D. Barker was found motionless Wednesday morning in her office on the third floor of the Acme General Store, located at the corner of Regent and King Streets in Georgetown. Barker of Parfit Harmony, West Bank, Demerara, was the manager of the store and was last seen alive on Monday at around 17 hours 30. The body was discovered by a 25-year-old colleague and later identified by her brother, Philip Barker, of Caneview Avenue, South Rheinfeld Gardens, Georgetown. Police in a statement said the body was examined by emergency medical technicians. The scene was processed and no marks of violence were seen, neither were no signs of breakage found on the building, the police said. The body is presently at a Lycan's funeral home, awaiting a post-mortem examination. Now, a fire suspected to be electrical in origin has left four persons homeless after their two-story house at 14A Sideline Dam, Good Fortune, West Bank, Demerara, went up in flames at around noon on Wednesday. Danica Paul was on the scene and filed this report. Neighbors were alerted of the fire by a 14-year-old female who was in the house at the time with her 8-year-old niece. The children, who were looking at the television, started to smell something burning, and upon inspection, the eldest child noticed fire coming from behind the refrigerator. She then informed her neighbors and her sister. The occupants, who have been renting the house for the past eight years, are Omadeli Turnington, a housewife, and her husband, Andrew Benjamin, a vendor. Benjamin told the newsroom that electricity has been fluctuated as recently as Tuesday, ever since the Guyana Power and Light, GPL, came and attached a wire to the house. The distraught man also noted that an electrician on Tuesday fixed the said refrigerator where the fire originated. But since this thing attacked, there's all this thing going. All the time, there's all it going. It's running away. They call the fan spinning, speed, speed, speed. Then you're going to slow down back to normal. Speed, 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 slow down back to normal. You got to turn out the freezer, all kind of thing. Everything, nothing gets for safe. The man is plug it out. It's the current, the, the rush of the current, you cut down the current. The rush of the current, you cut it down the current. The other occupant of the home, who was at the time in Georgetown, attending a church service, was notified of her house being engulfed in flames. Although neighbors formed a bucket brigade, nothing was saved from the fully furnished house. Austin, in tears, shared that the only thing was saved are the lives of the two children, which she is grateful for, but she added that her parents will need assistance to get back on their feet. Though the Guyana Fire Service arrived promptly at the scene, residents complained that they came without water and were not prepared, which eventually led to the house being completely gutted. Reporting for the newsroom, I am Danica Paul. Meanwhile, a Republic Day fire which started in a house at Lot 36 Lagrange, West Bank, Demerara, spread to two nearby buildings and has left millions of dollars in damages and 17 occupants homeless. Danica Paul joins us again. Ram Jati and Mohes Anantaram, Two of the victims of Tuesday's fire said though they cannot exactly estimate their loss, their house was fully furnished and they have been living there for the past 21 years. I can't estimate the loss but uh, I, I'm a seamstress. My husband is a tailor and like hundreds of people material gone. And what is in the house? I had microwave, fridge, blender, two television, two iron, a music set two three-piece chair sets, wardrobe, three wardrobe, three beds, five sewing machine, three never used yet. When the newsroom visited the fire scene on Wednesday, family members were seen cleaning up the remains of the destroyed two-story house. 
Anna Taram, who is trying to stay optimistic about their future, said she has been receiving tremendous support from family members and persons from her community, and she is extremely thankful. So far, two persons offered to help with the blocks and the cements, and that's it for now. I'm going to get um, my son, friends, and to come and help. As you can see, they're working right now. The Anatarams are currently residing at their daughter's residence in Iflot, West Coast Demerara, and are hoping to start rebuilding soon. On the other side of the fence, where majority of the damages were done, four apartments were destroyed. Three of those apartments were occupied by tenants, and to the front, a liquor store, and a house were burnt to the ground. The 148-feet lot housed 17 individuals who got to save nothing but the clothes on their backs. The owner of the business place and apartment buildings, popularly called Rambo, shared with the newsroom today that he cannot estimate his losses. However, he noted that he was currently repainting his business place to have it re-evaluated to set up his insurance. I buy for the week was over a thousand cases at Guinness and Banks Bear. Look them stand up right there. We see melt up bluey bluey. It's Banks Bear. It's the case showing away. Plus, they got uh, 600 or something case empty bottle. We say the bottle alone is 600 or something thousand. Right? You got some inside, they were born up. So, you got a canter, right? And then you have the whole music set were valued about 25, over 25 million dollars. Well furnished, right? Plus, um, it's upstairs and downstairs, right? I got next music set inside there when we play a room, big box like this. And um, then started washing machine from the back, coming down all these big, big transformers, so forget this thing. And five generators, one would just power up this whole building and one just go with the music set, right? Um, pressure washer, well, we just wash out here and so on. And a lot of tools, we don't ask nobody for nothing, welding, plan everything, everything, everything. I can't, I can't sit down for put nothing on paper on paper. Rambo has blamed the Guyana Fire Service, saying that his buildings could have been saved if firefighters had arrived on time and were well equipped to extinguish the fire. Reporting for the newsroom, I am Denica Paul. We tell you now that 27-year-old Dale Christopher of Tiger Bay, Georgetown, was shot and killed while attending a party that attracted some 500 persons at Hill Street Lodge, Georgetown, early on Tuesday. A wanted bulletin has been issued for 42-year-old Osafa Grundal of Freeman Street, East La Penitence, Georgetown, who is believed to be the main suspect. Isanel Patwa has more details. The Guyana Police Force issued a wanted bulletin on Wednesday for 42-year-old Freeman Street, East La Penitence, Georgetown resident Osafa Grundal. Grandal is wanted in connection with the murder of 27-year-old Christopher Dale of Tiger Bay, Georgetown. Police said anyone with information that may lead to the arrest of Osafa Grandal is asked to contact the nearest police station. All information will be treated with the strictest confidence. The police had reported that Dale was shot and killed while attending a party early Tuesday. Here is the scene of the party which was in full swing at about 6 o'clock and in clear violation of the COVID-19 curfew and other guidelines. Meanwhile, Dale's father told reporters that he is not aware of any issues that may have led to the death of his son. The next man right up and tell me, he didn't even want to tell me that my son dead. This is all, this all ain't nobody. You got to some party. This is the last night, now he knows what's going on. You know Dale to be in any problem with anybody? Well, I don't know. But I don't know. He went the whole night last night. He never got to party. This is all I know. The police reported that Christopher was shot once to the abdomen. According to the report, a taxi driver of Tocqueville Housing Scheme stated that he was driving on Mandela Avenue when he was stopped by three men who were carrying the bleeding Christopher. Together, they transported the victim to the Georgetown Public Hospital, where he was pronounced dead. Meanwhile, Grundall called Curlup is no stranger to the police. In September 2020, he had to stand trial in the High Court for manslaughter. Grundall and his co-accused, James Fraser, was jointly indicted for the capital offense of murder. The duo was jointly charged for murdering Marlon Rodney, known as George, between April 25th and April 30th, 2019, at Norton Street, Georgetown. 
Reporting for the newsroom, I am Ms. Sanella Patwo. When the newsroom returns, Guyana has approved Russia's Sputnik and China's Sinopharm COVID vaccines for emergency use as three more deaths are recorded. This is the newsroom. Guyana has recorded three more COVID-19 deaths between Tuesday and Wednesday, taking the country's death toll to 193. The Ministry of Health in a statement revealed that two males, a 48-year-old from Region 4, Demerara Mahaika, and a 65-year-old from Region 3, Essequibo Islands West, Demerara, died while receiving care at a medical facility on Tuesday. On Wednesday, a 63-year-old man from Region 4 died while receiving treatment. The latest fatalities also mean that 16 persons have died in February thus far. Meanwhile, Guyana on Wednesday recorded only five new COVID-19 cases from a total of 827 tests. The new cases were all recorded in Region 4. This takes the overall number of confirmed cases to 8,457 since Guyana recorded its first case in March 2020. An additional 34 recoveries were also recorded, taking the total number of recoveries to 7,834. There are 387 patients in home isolation, 37 are in institutional isolation and 7 patients are in the COVID-19 intensive care unit at the Infectious Disease Hospital. Meanwhile, the Minister of Health, Dr. Frank Anthony, on Wednesday confirmed that Ghana granted emergency use approval of the Russia Sputnik COVID-19 vaccine as well as China's Sinopharm vaccine. The health minister made the announcement during the daily COVID-19 update and noted that the emergency use approval was granted by the Government Analyst Food and Drug Administration. Ghana is now the 33rd country in the world to approve the Sputnik vaccine. However, these vaccines were not granted approval by the World Health Organization, but Minister Anthony stated that the paperwork was submitted for both vaccines to be approved. In the case of the uh, Sputnik V uh, or Sputnik V vaccine, um, we have been in discussions with uh, the Russian manufacturer uh, for quite some weeks now, and I've indicated this before. Because uh, when we review the data from the vaccine, uh, we saw that the vaccine is about 90.6% uh, um, efficacious. And um, of the vaccines so far, um, you know, this one has very high um, efficacy. And so we have started discussions uh, with them in order to be able to get some of these vaccines to Guyana. Those discussions have advanced and um, we have been able, through our Food and Drug um, Administration here, to issue an emergency use authorization for these vaccines. Um, we have also uh, issued um, emergency use authorization for the Sinopharm vaccine, which has an efficacy of 79.4%. Uh, Our process of issuing uh, emergency use authorization, we looked at uh, three main sources, how we can do that, or three main ways in which we can do that. The first is if the vaccine has been approved by what is called a stringent regulatory authority. So, uh, in, when we talk about stringent regulatory authorities, we're talking about the FDA in the United States, in Canada, in the UK, in Australia, and in Europe, they have a similar body, but it's named differently, not FDA. So, okay. once it has been approved by these authorities, then we would use the principle of reciprocity uh, to be able to um, approve it here in Guyana. Another way of approving these vaccines is if they have been approved by uh, the World Health Organization. And in the case of, so far, the WHO has only approved two vaccines, and that is the Pfizer vaccine and the AstraZeneca vaccine. They have uh, Sputnik, which is going to be, um, they have submitted the paperwork and I'm sure very shortly that that is going, good, going to go through a process of approval. And similarly with Sinopharm, which the WHO already has the documentation, and they should be uh, processing that as well. Okay. Um, and the third method that we use mm -hmm. 
as if this vaccine has been approved by uh, one of the bigger countries in the region or part of South America, the Caribbean region. And in the case of the Sputnik vaccine, we have seen that it has been given emergency use authorization in Brazil and in Argentina. And my understanding too that it has been used in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Okay. So um, we are working with these bodies and based on their findings, um, our FDA has been able to uh, grant that emergency use authorization. The announcement of the approval of the Sputnik vaccine was first made in a statement by the Russian Direct Investment Fund on Tuesday. The statement also noted that this vaccine is much cheaper and can be stored in a conventional refrigerator. Additionally, there are no strong allergies caused by Sputnik vaccines and the developers are working collaboratively with AstraZeneca on a joint clinical trial to improve the efficacy of the AstraZeneca vaccine. Now, a Canadian businesswoman and owner of Glam Up Canada, Fariza Sisouk, is offering free online classes to young girls and women in Guyana in the areas of marketing, design and beauty services. Sisouk, during an interview with the newsroom on Wednesday, explained that she, offered, she decided to offer the program here after realizing a lack of opportunities for girls in Guyana. She believes she can help make a difference by educating girls to start or expand their business. Upon completion of the classes, certificates will be issued to the young women and they will also benefit from a lifetime of mentorship. According to Sasuk, over 200 persons have already registered. So my name is uh, Fariza Sasuk. Um, I live in Toronto, Canada, and I'm the owner of Glam Up Canada. Uh, collectively, we've trained over a thousand students across Canada uh, in areas of beauty services, marketing and design and uh, mentorship. And uh, we're on a mission to change the world and empower young women and girls to launch their own businesses and realize their potential so um, they can uh, be successful. So my grandparents and parents are originally from Guyana. They immigrated here in 1978. And um, my business has been very successful here in Canada. And I realized that there, are, there is a lack of opportunity for young girls in uh, Guyana, and I feel that Guyana really needs this. And this is my chance to give back to the country and uh, give girls an education when it comes to beauty and marketing. And then they can inclusively use that to start businesses in Guyana and uh, find jobs. So my, job, my goal is to primarily motivate these girls, give them a free education so they can uh, build a movement in Guyana and, and empower another generation of, of leaders in the country. So it's basically free online classes in the areas of uh, cosmetology and makeup, marketing and design, and other beauty services. So it's an entire curriculum stru structured online with assignments at the end. And at the end of the assignments, uh, they will earn three certificates, one in um, cosmetology and makeup, one in business management and one in uh, beauty services. I'm going to be accepting um, girls over the age of 16 um, based on, uh, I have a section where I'm going to be evaluating uh, the reasons why they're interested in this program and what they will do uh, with this knowledge and that they, uh, that they with this uh, wealth of knowledge that they learn, what they would do with it. And um, also I have to verify also that they are actually residing in Guyana as well. Um, I just encourage all the young girls across Guyana and young women to apply. This is an amazing opportunity for you guys. Um, even if you guys are not interested in launching your business, at least you guys can gain some knowledge based on the curriculum that we have structured. And you can uh, find a job, it could just be for your own personal interests, or you maybe down the road, you'd be interested in starting your own business. I think all the girls in Guyana, if you do have a passion for beauty, marketing or design to take advantage of this opportunity because you are going to be getting three Canadian certificates, absolutely free. Um, there is no catch or anything to this. And I think you will find it very, very beneficial, very, very motivating, and you'll realize your potential so you can make a difference there in Guyana. Still ahead on the newsroom, the government is reviewing its decision to remove Sivon's Waste Management Inc. from the controversial plot of land. The Agriculture Minister says the PBPC has to borrow money to finance the 2021 budget because the coalition left the Treasury empty and the Tourism Minister says the opposition is racializing the budget. This is the newsroom.
As the government looks to review its decision to remove Sivon's Waste Management Inc. from a plot of land it claims was illegally procured, it is also assuring Guyanese that its push to repossess illegally siphoned off state lands is not vindictive. Kurt Campbell reports. Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs Anil Nandlal on Wednesday declared that the government is in no way running a vindictive enterprise in its bid to repossess state lands that were illegally sold and awarded under the previous a Partnership for National Unity Alliance for Change coalition. Nandlal said the government's action in this regard is part of protecting the patrimony of the state. That once we are satisfied that investments were made and those investments were genuine and that they are intended to create jobs, they are intended to foster the public good and Guyana can benefit from those investments, those transactions will be treated differently. And because the government's policy is not necessarily want to repossess lands that have been given by a previous administration lawfully and regularly. That is not the government's policy. This is not a vindictive enterprise in which we are engaged. This comes even as he confirmed moves by the government to review a decision to have Sivon's Waste Management Inc. give up lands it procured for $100 million under the tenure of the APNU AFC through the Guyana Lands and Surveys Commission. Nandla said although the sale was being reviewed on a direct appeal by Sivon's Chief Executive Officer Merce Archer to President Avran Ali, the transaction remains highly illegal. Though the review is ongoing, we have not committed one way or another. There is no doubt that a lot of money has been expended. That is obvious of there. However, that does not negate the wrongdoing which was done. You still regard it as a wrongdoing? It is still a wrongdoing. Right. It is still a wrongdoing. You cannot take lands that do not fall under the administration of an entity and pretend to deal with it as if it's land that you have authority to deal with. And that's the situation here. This land was never available for lands and surveys to deal with. It was given by the state to the National Sports Commission. The Attorney General said Archer, in a direct appeal to President Irfan Ali, has explained the process in which he engaged, how he arrived at the position of getting a lease for the land, the monies already paid and invested, while also outlining how the land will benefit Guyana and the number of jobs that will be created in that area of Georgetown. Those are significant factors which we will review and take into account. But, you know... And, 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 and that is where we are currently with the transaction. Archer had previously said that his company followed all guidelines and legal procedures in the purchase of a plot of land that the government is now seeking to repossess. Archer is hoping for a resolution void of any legal showdown. He claimed that the land was purchased from the Guyana Lands and Surveys Commission in 2018 for $100 million, of which $80 million has already been paid. The CEO said, as per the written agreement with the Guyana Lands and Surveys Commission, he was told that the transport for the land will take three years to be transferred, and once that is done, the remaining $20 million would be paid. In the interim, Archer explained that he was granted a 50-year lease by the Guyana Lands and Surveys Commission, which he's currently paying on simultaneously. The CEO said he also received the government evaluation for the land, putting the value at $47 million. He said this by this, when he approached the commission, he was told he has to pay $100 million. Kurt Campbell, Newsroom. The Ghana Police Force on Wednesday issued a wanted bulletin for 40-year-old Shabika Chase in connection with the offense of trafficking narcotics. The police report noted that the offense occurred on February 18, 2021 at Charles Street in Georgetown. Chase's last known address is 180 Charlotte Street. Anyone with information that may lead to the arrest of Shabika Chase is asked to contact the nearest police station. All information will be treated with the strictest confidence. Now, using herself as an example of the People's Progressive Party civics inclusiveness, the Minister of Tourism, Industry and Commerce, Onesh Waldron, on Wednesday had caused to upbraid the coalition opposition for what she said was the radicalizing and racializing of the policy debate on the 2021 national budget. 
The minister said despite her family's connections to the APNU AFC coalition, she was chosen to serve in Dr. Irfan Ali's cabinet, something she believes speaks to a party and a philosophy that cannot credibly be held out to be racist and non-inclusive. The minister, who was speaking on day two of the debates, called for an end to the race bait debating by the coalition MPs and instead for attention to be given to addressing the government's policies support by the fiscal plan. And despite the fact that I had never before even dreamed of being involved in politics, Mr. Speaker, this speaks to the core and the DNA of a president and a party and a philosophy that cannot credibly be held out as racist and non-inclusive. And this is not just window dressing, Mr. Speaker. Take a look at the portfolio that has been assigned to those of whom the opposition would dismiss as tokens. Labor, accounting for hundreds of thousands of employees and their rights. Foreign affairs, home affairs, the portfolios of any energy generation, telecommunications, civil defense, and others assigned to the office of the Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, People can examine for themselves how portfolios were assigned under the AP and UAFC government. I don't have to delve into their record. It is there and it speaks for itself. Suffice it to say, Mr. Speaker, as a person new to politics, my own responsibilities are far in excess of those that the previous administration sought to confer, even on their, on their prime minister. And people noticed. Now, the Minister of Agriculture, Zulfikar Mustafa, on Wednesday had caused to once again defend the government's decision to finance a portion of the 2021 national budget through loans as opposition members of parliament continue to disapprove the move. The minister contended that borrowing was necessary because of the state in which the former APNU AFC coalition government left the Treasury. Kurt Campbell reports. The government's decision to finance a portion of the 2021 national budget through loans has once again come in for criticism by a Partnership for National Unity Alliance for Change parliamentary opposition. But Minister of Agriculture Zulfikar Mustafa says borrowing at this time is necessary. According to the minister, this is so because of the unhealthy state in which the Treasury was handed over to the People's Progressive Party government when it came to office in August 2020. Mustafa told the House that the Treasury had a deficit and was bankrupt when the PPPC took office. Office. What they received, the treasury was healthy, the economy was healthy. When the PVP left government in 2015, they had time to borrow, they had time to borrow money. But what we received, what we received August last year, the Honorable Minister of Finance will tell you, he already answered the question that the treasury was in a deficit that the Treasury was bankrupt. As a result of that, there was no fund in the country, Mr. Speaker. That's the reality. Mustafa was responding to former Minister of Public Security, Kemraj Ramchatan, who during his contribution to the ongoing 2021 budget debates on Wednesday condemned the government for reversing several tax measures put in place by the former APNU AFC government while resorting to borrowing to finance a $383.1 billion budget, the largest budget ever. Ramjitan told the government MPs in the House that they should not get into the habit of borrowing, reasoning that it will burden citizens in years to come. The AFC coalition government, the new AFC coalition government, that we were taxing and spending, you are now borrowing and spending. That's your mantra. Borrow and spend. But you know what borrowings do? Borrowings mean that you'll have to tax future generations yet unborn. You seem not to appreciate that. And that is why this year's budget, similar of ilk like last year's budget, we have $109 billion that will have to be borrowed so that you can execute on that amount of spending of $383 billion. It was under the AP and UAFC government that heavy debt was taken on the overdraft facilities despite hundreds of taxes being implemented by the previous regime. It would also be reason that the taxes had helped to cripple the cash and growth in the economy that led to the massive overdraft. The Multi-Agency Coordinating Committee for Addressing the Influx of Venezuelan Migrants into Guyana met on Saturday last to give attention to the migrant uh, circumstances via a corresponding effort between the government and international partners. The committee is co-chaired by the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Hugh Todd, and Minister of Parliamentary Affairs and Governance, Gail Teixeira. Sheena Henry reports. 
Representatives from government ministries, agencies and United Nations agencies have lauded the resuscitation of the committee. Among those attending were Permanent Secretary Ambassador Elizabeth Harper, Director of the Bilateral Unit Ambassador Michael Brotherson, and Director of the Legal Division Kezia Campbell Erskine. They were joined by representatives of various local and international organizations and agencies, including the International Organization for Migration, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, UNICEF, the United Nations Population Fund, the Pan American Health Organization, the Ministry of Amerindian Affairs, Local Government and Regional Development, Health, Education, Human Services and Social Security, and Housing and Water, the Guyana Police Force, Regional Health Services, the Civil Defense Commission, and the Child Care and Protection Agency. In 2019, there was an estimated 4,000 Venezuelan migrants in Guyana. Most of these persons have fled neighboring Venezuela, currently faced with political and economic struggles. Many of the migrants, having been unable to receive basic services due to lack of documentation, have since been squatting along the east bank of Demerara. Villages like Herstelling and Grove have been growing since shacks and makeshift structures have been erected, hosting more than 100 people. In its bid to incorporate Venezuelan migrants into the local economy, the Ministry of Health has also been transcribing many of its COVID-19 related brochures and information to Spanish. It has also been releasing the daily COVID-19 dashboard in Spanish. The Ministry of Education has also put systems in place to integrate children into the public schools. In September, the United States government committed $5 million U.S. million to Guyanese authorities to help the migrants who have fled to Guyana. For the Newsroom, I am Sheena Henry. When the Newsroom returns to financial weather and bridge reports along with sports. Welcome back to Newsroom. Now for a little bit what's happening in sport. We're starting off with some motor racing news. Kurt Johnson, a competition consultant, is leading the Team Mohammed's sponsored preparation of the drag race trip at South Dakota. Speaking to Newsroom Sport on Tuesday, he explained the technical and precise work needed to give the cars the best possible chance of performing at optimal levels. You're watching here some significant track prep. And this track prep has been ongoing over the last few weeks, spearheaded by Team Mohammed to get this surface in its best possible shape for Sunday's drag race and meet here at South Dakota Circuit. I spoke to Kirk Johnson, one of the competition consultants, to give us an insight into the amount of work they've been doing to get these machines to produce at their best. We have a company that we build equipment, uh, we help, well, we've got about 165 racetracks around the world. Um, we came in here, they, you guys had just put in a brand new surface, uh, concrete and asphalt, uh, finished it, real nice surface walls. We came in, basically put the rubber surface down on it, um, using various pieces of equipment, race tires and we, uh, we apply about a 30 second of an inch of rubber on the whole surface. Uh, we have traction compound, which is a glue, makes it really sticky, allows the tires to, to grip to it on the race cars, and uh, increases the traction coefficient so that the cars are allowed to put more power down than you could on, say, normal asphalt or concrete. And that's what we've done. To go from a, a completely bare surface to a competition ready surface is probably 60 man hours, working hours. Um, takes about seven days when you equate in all the other issues and things you have to deal with, so about seven days. Um, and then from this point, it takes about a day every time that you want to get ready to go racing. Uh, like Oz has three cars here, and uh, one is a pure race car, one is a, a very fast, fast street car, and the other one is, is a street car. Um, I think out of the white car, you probably see a, I think you might see a 690, 
I think the fastest it's ever gone here is 760 in the past. Uh, I, I certainly think that the 690 is capable. Um, out of the other two cars, I think uh, out of the slower car, a 790 is possible, and a 720 out of the, the center of the two cars. And then I also hear you got a pretty wicked Celica running around somewhere. And uh, you have fast cars down here. Um, in reality, what we have right now, I think would support almost any car in the islands. Um, in the long run, I think we may come in and do some grind work to the concrete and possibly replace the asphalt again with a, a tighter mix that will allow more power to be put down on it. You heard it there from competition consultant Kirk Johnson and he's explained to us that one of these cars with continuous track prep over the next couple of days and hopefully no rain on Sunday and one of these cars could hit a sub seven second time here at South Dakota which would mean a new record. Reporting for the news zoom, I'm Akin Green. Meanwhile, T. Mohammed's lead driver Terence Cox has said the intention is for all three GTRs to run sub-8 seconds time when they compete at the South Dakota circuit at the first round of the drag racing championships on Sunday. Hakim Green spoke to Cox on Tuesday and filed this report. I'm nestled in one of the cars that are going to be driving here on Sunday at the South Dakota circuit. Unfortunately, this car won't be piloted by seasoned driver Terence Cox, who's returned yet again to pilot two of Team Mohammed's cars here on Sunday. According to Cox, given the amount of track prep done by Team Mohammed, these cars can go extremely fast on Sunday. Man, I am so happy to be out here. I, I absolutely love this country and love the people. The, the weather here is just beautiful every time I come. Um, it's exactly what I want. So, so happy to be back down here. It's been uh, a little while since I've been on a race car, uh, especially drag racing. I did a roll race event back in October, but um, it, it feels really good to be back down here driving some cars for Mr. Mohammed. Mr. Mohammed has done an excellent job with the facility here, with track prep and just all the amenities that he keeps adding here. We now have restrooms out here. We have uh, more uh, just just better coverage coverage for our cars and stuff like that. So we have a, a lot better facility. And then the track prep is on point. Like uh, when I first started coming out here, the track was you know kind of a little bit sketchy, a little bit scary. But uh, since he's started coming out here, we've got a better launch pad. We're now running a quarter mile. He's put down completely fresh concrete, completely fresh asphalt, and brought in a, uh, a specific team to help us prep the track so we can put on the best show that we can for the fans out here. These cars are going to go very quick. I, I, I know all three cars are gonna go sevens this weekend. Uh, I believe the Nismo's got you know sevens in it, and then the, the black car's got Definitely deep sevens in it, and then the white car is going to be bottom sevens, possibly even a six-second pass. We're really hoping for with the track prep. It's exactly how we get it in the U.S. So we're uh, we we think if the cars are capable, I think we can put on a really good show. It's going to be a lot of it's going to be on the tree and uh, whatnot, but I think it's. I think the glide's got it. I mean, that, that car's making a lot of power. It's going very, very quick so far, and, uh, and we've still got so much more to go. Um, but I, it's definitely going to be a good race. It's definitely going to be close, but I, I really think the Goliath has it. Drag racing is really picking up. Uh, it, it's really nice to see so many cars out here, especially Mr. Muhammad. He now has three cars out here, and we're trying to build a fourth one. And then, uh, and then, so we have the super for competition now. So we have someone to compete against. You know, we're not just putting on a show for of ourselves. We're actually getting to race someone. And um, just the drag racing has just gotten really big out here. And Mr. Muhammad has done an excellent job of bringing this sport together for this country. The biggest takeaway from Cox's comment just now is the fact that how much infrastructure and the improvement of Guyana's drag racing has happened over the years he's seen coming to Guyana. And for an international driver, that is a great compliment for us here in Guyana. Now, the GMRC is going to allow in a limited amount of spectators 
Um, the Slando stickers would have been starting selling from since Thursday at the club. However, for those who cannot attend the event due to limited capacity, eNetworks will be streaming the event live. Reporting for the newsroom, I can breathe. News now, Ghana Jaguar skipper Leon Johnson said his side will look to tighten up in a few areas as they embark on a semi-final clash against Windward Islands Volcanoes in the CG Insurance Super 50 Cup on Thursday in Antigua. The long-standing captain is also excited about the return of West Indies players Versami Pamol and Ramon Rifa for this crucial phase of the tournament. There are a couple of things we, we still need to get right, I think. A couple of times we collapsed, you know, against Barbados and against in that. Probably the two better bowling attacks in in the competition. And we didn't bat 50 of it, just just bat it over 40 overs. And that's something you see, we spoke about and we don't want to to have a car and especially coming up in, in knockout games. Uh you know, we we've gotten better in the field. I think we, last game we put on a chance. We've gotten better as the tournament has progressed. But I think you know, feeling is a is a big part of of limited overs cricket. And I generally feel the teams that, that feel better tend to win tournaments, feel better consistently. So that's something obviously we, we spoke about. We continue to work hard on. The inclusion of, of Versami and, and Raymond uh, it obviously gives the team and the guys a big boost. You know, we've been playing well and to have two, two internationals come back. I think Raymond brings another dimension with his, with his left arm bowling, his left arm seam bowling. And we all know very Sammy, uh, crafty old, old operator. So it's good. It's good to have these guys back. You know, guys have been performing well thus far in the tournament as well. And you know, <laughs> we'll have a, a headache to select eleven players to put on the park once everybody's fit on Thursday. Meanwhile, Johnson has praised the work ethic of opener Tevin Imlac, who has produced two solid knocks in the Super 50 thus far. Coming in as a replacement for the out-of-form asset footed in, Imlac made 38 against Trinidad and Tobago Red Force in a century opening stand with Chanda Paul Hemraj and followed up with 37 not out against Windward Islands Volcanoes. Johnson said the presence of Imlac at the top of the order offers a different tactical option to the Jaguars. He's been, he's been putting a lot of work when he's not been playing. You see, you know, he's a young guy, very fit guy, and he works hard in his game. You know, he, he came in, he got the opportunity against Trinidad and and he did relatively well. I think the left right nation as well goes across at the top of the yard. Uh, over the previous seasons, we've always had the the left handers opening. I think that makes it a bit easier for teams to plan against so some bowlers to you know bowl to the two left handers at the top of the yard. It's kind of easy. It's not much pressure on them in terms of, of the line and the length is very similar. So having the left right combination has has it's been very fruitful for us. Now, Chris Gale is expected to return to West Indies T20 squad for the first time in two years when the side takes on the visiting Sri Lankans at the start of March. West Indies will announce a squad later this week, but Gale has interrupted a stint with the Quetta Gladiators in the PCL to return to the Caribbean, having been just given indications that he will feature in the three-match T20 series against Sri Lanka. Uh, with the other members, Gale will undergo a fitness assessment before the final squad is named. If he does play, it will be the first time he has represented West Indies in any format since August 2019 when he played an ODI against India. It will be also exactly two years to the day since he last played a T20 international against England in March 2019. And England put in a feeble batting display to crumble to 1-12 all out at the hands of a dominant India on the first day of the third test in Ahmedabad. The tourists completely surrendered the advantage of winning the toss in the day-night test, succumbing to left-arm spinner Akshar Patel's 6 for 38. Zach Crawley, returning after missing the first two test matches with a wrist injury, made an, attack, uh, an attractive 53, but was the second batsman to fall in a collapse of four wickets for nine runs, part of an overall slide of the last eight falling for 38. India lost Shubman Gill for 11, Shateshwar Pujara without scoring, and Virat Kohli for 27, closing on 99 for three, with Rohit Sharma unbeaten 
on 57. And with that, we have come to the end of the news for this evening. Of course, you can find updates on these and other stories on our website, newsroom.gy, our Facebook page, and Instagram. On behalf of the entire news team, my name is Avanash Ramzan. Be safe. Thanks for watching. See you next time.